you guys doing today? Nice and early on a Sunday, and this is a sexy crowd, and you guys look good. Far better than the building looks from the outside, but uh, no one's ever noticed that before. I, I've seen better parking garages, so I, I wasn't quite sure what to make of that. We're going to have a little fun this morning. i got some props, so hopefully you like. Um, first thing, since it's Sunday morning, this is the early service, by the way, in case you didn't know. We're going to have communion a little later. We've got some Diet Coke and some Mentos. And I'm prepared. I, I have a towel. So, so uh, like Chris told you, uh, oh, by the way, Chris, that, that was a loan uh, at, at 500 bucks. Uh, I, I might have not have been as clear as I should have been. We're at the Free Thought Festival. You know this. I'm going to skip this slide. We're, we're getting ready to go. Uh, a little bit about me and my company. The Polaris Financial Planning, 10%, everyone always asks, gross or net? Okay, I give 10% of the gross of the revenue. So uh, if you need a financial advisor, please hire me. I can give more money to make these things happen. Uh, here's the website. The state of Illinois really insists, in the most polite terms a legal entity can, that I have to tell you that I'm registered with the state of Illinois. I can help anyone in any state, but I'm registered in Illinois. After I tell you that I'm registered in Illinois, they require that I tell you it doesn't mean shit. <laughs> so, uh, I don't know, I guess that's how the government works these days. So, uh, my blog, Skeptic Money, I'd, I'd love you to have you come visit there and make some comments. Anyone who occasionally wants to write a post, I could sure use some help, so feel free to contact me if you're interested in that kind of thing. Uh, one of the things that I like to talk about before I get into the meat of the subject in you know, this is a show of hands, we're going to be a little interactive today. How many people here are atheists, skeptics, free thinkers, humanists, secularists, whatever? Okay, now keep your hands up. Do you think the world would be a better place if more people not necessarily agreed with you, but thought like you and were able to, okay, so now the question is, what the fuck are you doing about it? <laughs> and, and I mean it in the most serious way. You can put your hands down. Thank you, both of you. Uh, you need to give time. And there's students here, there's members of the community here that have given a phenomenal amount of time to make this happen. So hundreds and hundreds of people can show up and hear these speakers. So get involved. If you don't have the time, donate some money to somebody. And people who are watching this video at home on their YouTube channel, please give some money to somebody, whether it's a student group. Find a student group in your area. It's going to be the way we grow for the future. So Chris mentioned some of these, so I'm going to go through this real quick. Uh, things that I've uh, sponsored or contributed to in the last couple of years. Skepti Camp in Chicago, Skepticon 3. I, I underwrote that so they could go from a room of 500 people to 1,400 people. So about 700 more students got to go see atheist thinkers because I donated a little bit of money. I thought it was a phenomenal investment, so I'm very happy about that. American Atheist Conventions, JREF in the classroom, they, they created a, a tool that teachers can call and order for free to teach critical thought to students in their classroom. Skepticon 4, uh, Skeptic Camp Chicago, Reason Rally, I'm the only corporate sponsor. And that's the kind of thing that's going to change the world where politicians, we actually had two politicians speak. One of them was a religious person, but he stepped up and acknowledged that we exist, which is not a whole lot, but it's better than what we used to get. So we're moving in the right direction. Uh, American Atheist Convention again. Atheist Nexus, if you've ever been online. Skeptics of Oz last weekend. And of course, this ass-kicking phenomenal convention. Uh, a little bit about me. When I was a kid, I believed some crazy stuff. <laughs> you know, all the things. I was fascinated by aliens, pyramids, Bigfoot, all kinds of stuff. The weirdest shit you can imagine. I thought was real. Now, luckily for me, I was Methodist, so I never learned about this Jesus. I learned about this Jesus. <laughs> right? So I, I used to say, I guess I still say, uh, uh, Methodists are kind of pussies compared to fundamentalist Christians. When I was in Arkansas, they looked at Methodists and Catholics, and they're like, they're not really Christians. They're just posers. But that's what I was brought up. When I was 13, I had questions for my minister in confirmation class, and he could not answer. I thought he was like the most learned person in the entire world about Methodism. And I was stunned that he couldn't answer my questions. So I said, I'm not convinced yet. I don't want to stand up in front of 500 people on a Sunday and swear that I will forever be a Methodist if I don't 
I'm not saying it's wrong, but I'm not convinced yet. And he said, just do it for your parents. Oh. And I thought, oh, my mistake. I took this serious. I, I thought this was something meaningful. So that started my days as being an atheist. My, my parents took the position that uh, I was uh, going through a phase. But then I ran into this guy. Uh, watched Cosmos every week when it came on in real time on PBS in Chicago. And I had to, I had to go to the, my parents' room and watch on a nine inch black and white TV because they were watching Love Boat on, on, <laughs> on the bigger black and white TV in the living room. <laughs> so uh, then I got married to a lovely agnostic and we had kids. So, Thing kind of happens from time to time, people. And everybody on both sides of the family wanted us to get the child baptized. So we did, but you can't just do that. You've got to be a member of a church. So we joined one, no big deal. It's just a little water. Then we started going. Then the kids entered preschool at the church. Then they entered the Christian school at the church. Somehow I ended up on the board for the Christian school. Oh, and this was Missouri Synod Lutheran for anybody who used to be a Minnesota or Wisconsin Synod. You know, again, no, Missouri Synod is the one true faith. Um, I spent three years on that school board, including two as the treasurer, and actually stopped the school from collapsing financially and going into bankruptcy and, and folding. So, I got some shit to make up for, so, you know, basically is what I'm saying. After my third year ended on the board, I was so delighted I was off because I spent five years in this church pretending to be a Missouri Synod Lutheran. And when I finally got off the board, four or five elders cornered me one Sunday after service and they said, we want you to be the outreach chair for the church. So I would be the number one person bringing new members into the church. And apparently I had all the correct qualifications. I'm relatively articulate. I'm white. Uh, <laughs> I have a penis. So, you know, <laughs> everything you can ask for in the Missouri Synod Lutheran Church. So something kind of snapped in my head and I said, I, I can't do this anymore. And since then I've taken up a, a life of arguing with Christians. And that was prompted by my two years in hell, uh, Arkansas. Uh, <laughs> and I started talking about biblical errancy and they've learned this thing called apologetics, which my son loves the fact that their method of arguing starts with the word apology. Brilliant boy, I love it. So I would argue with them, but sometimes it didn't work and sometimes they'd get tired. And after five, 10, 60 minutes of arguing with the Christian, they'd get tired and they'd want to leave. And I said, well, you know, before you leave, let's focus on something that we share in common. I think I can make the point that there are some basic morals that are so uniform that you as a Christian and me as the atheist, we can at least agree on them. So they're like, well, yeah, sure, I guess so. So let me give you a little scenario. You're in a dark city, a big city in a dark alley. Maybe New York, three o'clock in the morning, nobody's around, and you're lost. And out of the darkness comes an ogre. Okay, he's eight feet, five inches tall, 450 pounds of muscle, and a little beer belly. But okay, you know, he's strong. He grabs you with one arm and lifts you two feet off the ground. You can kind of sort of hit him a little bit. No one's going to hear you scream. You realize you're in serious trouble. But the ogre is not going to let it go at that. He puts a pistol up to the side of your head. And he leans over in your ear and he says, do you love me? And you're thinking, what? What do, you, what do you mean, do I love you? And he says, if you love me, I will make you a cake. <laughs> and for those who know what this cake is, yes, I intended that cake. Um, and if you don't love me, I'm gonna kill you and turn you into a zombie. And I'll ask the Christian, is this ogre moral? Is this ogre engaged in a moral activity? And they will always say, at least every time I've done this, no, this is immoral. And I said, I'm so glad because we agree. We agree now that we found something so basic that even despite our different worldviews, we agree on it and it's fantastic. So I said, let's take this same scenario and we're not gonna change the rules of the game at all. What we're gonna do is magnify the reward and the punishment. And so instead of him making you a cake, you get to live with the ogre ever in a land of beauty and grace and if you don't love him he's gonna kill you over and over and over for all of eternity in a lake of fire and usually the Christian I'm discussing with at this point they say ah, you're talking about Christianity and I said we agree twice now that's fantastic I am talking about Christianity and you have just agreed the basic foundation of Christianity let's pretend for a moment that it's true is immoral 
and they give me this look. <laughs> Usually at that point, they just say something like, I, I gotta go. And, and it's a nice, convenient, and polite way to end a conversation. So, the good news is where our society is headed is fantastic. This is from the Pew Forum, and we have uh, different age groups, generations, 3% nuns, 8, 13, 20, 26% for the millennials are nuns. Uh, my understanding of the definition of nun is the vast majority of them simply are atheists, even if they don't use the word. They don't even affiliate with the church. They don't say they're Methodist or Catholic. They just don't even acknowledge that they're members or of a cultural group or a society. So the vast majority of them are atheists, in my opinion. But this is a new study, uh, the Public Religion Research Institute, funded by the um, Templeton Foundation. If you know them, they have an objective to make religion look better than it does. They still came up with 25% of millennials between 18 and 24 years of age are nuns. Again, the vast majority of them non-religious. The funny thing is if you go read the report, this uh, non-Christian religions includes things like Pastafarians, <laughs> Jedi. Okay, I'm gonna count them too. Then the last category here, you have don't know. That's what DK stands for, don't know. Well, if you don't know what religion you're even a member of, you're probably an atheist. So, and then the people that actually said they're in a religion, I don't know, five to 10% of them are atheists that just would actually acknowledge that they're in some religion. So depending on how you count it, we're looking at 40 to 50% of students between 18 and 24 are atheists. Here is what they had to say about Christianity. Judgmental, hypocritical, anti-gay, too involved in politics, teaches the same shit as every other religion. Very high numbers. We're winning the war. We're getting close to the tipping point. So this is fantastic. I just wanted a break from... <laughs> I figured anything with 25 million views is worth sharing. <laughs> okay, so how you can help. And this is the important part where I need Quinn's help. He's going to volunteer to come up here and help me out. We're going to do a little science, Quinn. You good with that? Okay. And to do science, you must have a fucking lab coat. <laughs> I went online and for $15 I got science paper. And it comes in a convenient roll and, and it's easily divisible. The shipping was a bitch though. It's, we're gonna, I'm going to show you the Bernoulli principle. It creates a lower pressure and it, and it will lift the paper by me blowing over the top of it. Well, help it. Okay, that sucked. <laughs> I'm going to ask for a refund. Now we have a, a bigger example. And the reason I like Steve Spangler Science, the, the thing that's on the, the screen, we'll have you move forward just a little bit. They not only have cool science toys that you can buy, but sometimes they give you ideas of how you can do it even cheaper. So you can hang on to the end of, oh, actually, I got to hang on to that. Now, see what I did there? I left you holding the bag. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> now, okay, if we get this stretched out now, hold it up to your mouth, and we were going to see how many breaths it takes you to fill it up. You ready? Okay, I only got 20 minutes. Okay. <laughs> Give Quinn a hand. Oh, wait, wait, no, you gotta help me. Here, here. I'll, I'll try. Oh, don't touch the microphones. Now we're gonna use the Bernoulli principle. You ready? Thank you, Quinn. Thank you very much. So the idea is just make it a little fun for youths. Uh, have something fun to show them, have a little excitement. I think that's all we've got in there for now. We'll, we'll come back to that. <laughs> well, I don't need a lab coat anymore. Uh, they actually sell a little kit with a nozzle that you screw onto your Diet Coke, and it has a little pin that drops the Mentos. So it not only goes six or eight or 10 feet, it'll go 25, 30 feet into the air. Very impressive. 
He has several books that have great experiments you can do with kids of all ages. So he likes bubbles on fire. And so now we're gonna go through uh, one of the things that we bought for our daughter. She's in cheerleading, and she had a whole bunch of her, uh, her entire cheerleading squad over to the house. And they made bracelets, like friendship bracelets with beads. But these were special magic beads. They're all white in regular light, but in ultraviolet light, they change different colors. So all the girls were set up under a black light, and they made these friendship beads that were secret codes. And only they knew what the code was, and they would come up into the main part of the house, and they would go back to white, because our lighting doesn't have ultraviolet light. Or they could step outside, and they would change colors again. So these 15 girls were like, how does that work? What makes that happen? And so now they're excited. They want to talk about science. They want to talk about the electromagnetic spectrum. So it's just another fantastic way to get them involved. Um, so have your kids ask questions, lots of questions. Science, videos, you don't necessarily have to force them to sit down and watch the evolution box set, although that might be prudent. But in the playroom, have it on. They become accustomed to their entire life being exposed to science, around the science. And some of these things you can do for your own kids. Some of these you can give as gifts. We're talking younger siblings, nieces and nephews, the kids down the street. Some of them are gonna be way over the top for the, the friends and family that you know, but some of them you can slip in. Any little thing that you can do can make a difference. I think that if every atheist went out and it helped deconvert one or two young adults under the age of 18, within one generation we'll be 50% atheist in this country. And we can just really start solving some serious problems. So they need to know how the world really works. It's critically important <laughs> that they understand reality. Well, we can have a little fun with it too, you know, while we're at it. Uh, movies, I love movies. And there's a lot of great movies that you can talk about Greek and Roman mythology, ancient systems of belief, where you're not talking about it, you, it's someone else presenting it for you. Uh, here's a few samples, Agora. Troy, Thor, okay. you know, anything to get them thinking about another system, another system, and you can present it all as different mythologies, and uh, Agora particularly is a wonderful movie. Christians didn't like it because it painted them in a bad light, I call truth. Um, <laughs> or you can tell them the truth about the Egyptian pyramids. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> so. You know, these things are important for them to understand how the world works. Uh, Scooby-Doo, right? Great show. Books, i am only got a couple samples, but there's dozens and dozens of them. These two are my favorites because they are so visually stunning. If the kid can't read, two-year-old, one-year-old can look at these books and just be in awe of them. You can read them as bedtime stories. You can teach them about evolution. You can teach them about reality. And they're simply gorgeous books, just fantastic. Uh, let's see what do we have next? Letting Go of God. Anyone heard Letting Go of God? Yeah. If you if you haven't, please do so. Uh, quick story: My son and my daughter listened to this when they were barely teens, eight or eight or ten years old. When I finally told them I was an atheist, I bought this two-hour CD, and my daughter, my wife said, who was religious at the time, "You won't play that for the kids." I, I wouldn't, I'd never. Uh, first time we're in the car, me and the two kids, I popped it in, they listened to it. I didn't make a big deal, they enjoyed it, they liked it. A Couple weeks later, all four of us are in the car, me and the wife, two kids, and we drive by a furniture store called Fred's Furniture Store in Backwoods of Missouri. For those of you who have seen this, there's a part where Julia Sweeney goes to a camp, and to make God more personable, they call him Fred. And they say, Fred is love, Fred is love. So we drive by Fred's furniture store in the back seat. My kids start going, Fred's furniture is love. <laughs> I'm driving. And my wife's looking over at me. I'm like, I, I don't know. I, there was a fire, a flood, locusts. I, I don't know what happened. And I'm driving. You know? And she says, well, if they listen to it, I, I guess I should at least know what they've heard. And I said, great. And I hit play. <laughs> On a CD player. It's also been turned into a movie. So please go get that. It's a treat for yourself. It's just fantastic. Watch Glee. I mean, anything that the fundamentalist Christians don't like, expose kids to it. It's got, it's got to be good. 
Magic tricks. This is a great little story for my daughter. We go to magic shops and you get like a little free show because usually the person behind the counter is an actual magician. And we bought her this little trick. It's a paddle trick for anyone who knows magic. And we get it home and she runs up to her room and she reads the instructions because that's why you pay $12 for this little piece of shitty plastic. But she reads the instructions, she's like, I don't get it. So I come and I help her explain it. And she reads it over and she puts it down on the table and she goes, it's a trick. <laughs> What did you think it was actual magic? But it was a great learning experience for her. And then since then, she has been doing that trick to some of her friends. And she's amazed because it's so simply obvious exactly what she's doing because she knows the trick. But her friends don't. So she loves doing that. And they have other magic tricks. So it's just good fun. Uh, YouTube. I, I really kind of missed this until I went to DC for the Reason Rally. The number of people that were in love thankful to, admiring of YouTubers was staggering. So a few of my favorites, uh, The Thinking Atheist, and he was here earlier, Aaron Ra, fantastic work. Dark Matter 2525, more of a cartoon kind of thing, but hysterical. Mr. Deity, beautiful stuff. And Atheist Experience. And a lot of these things have helped me become a better arguer, debater, presenter myself. So I appreciate the work that they've done as well. Blogs. There's too many for me to mention, and I'll end up offending somebody here by not mentioning their blog. So if you're in doubt, just go to Skeptic Money. But uh, <laughs> music, we've got a couple performers to mention. Yeah. He also has, The yeah, Storm is fantastic. He also has a DVD concert that's out you can buy from Amazon, fantastic. A brand new artist, Shelly Siegel. Love her voice, just absolutely fantastic. I got to meet her in DC as well. Great songs, very clever. George Robb, you've not met him. Uh, again, clever lyrics, brilliant work. Tim Minchin, I'm sorry, Roy Zimmerman, I didn't mention. He's gonna be in Champaign-Urbana May 1st, and then he's coming up to Wisconsin. So if you are not aware of that, please check out his website. I didn't memorize the dates, but he's coming here in the first week or so of May in a couple locations. So go check that out. Mentos. There you go. I told you you were going to see Mentos and Coke together. There we go. See, Chris was worried I might actually do it. Yeah, see, I can see him. That'd be Dale's problem. But we've done this with our kids and kids they know, and they're just fascinated, and you get to explain what's in a Diet Coke and the carbonation effects and how it works, and it just goes really, really well. They put some work in this, didn't they? I guess that's how you get five million views. You know, that are having a kitten in there. <laughs> Kitten getting sprayed with Mentos coke. <laughs> no. So you get the idea. Uh, optical illusions. Uh, optical illusions. A friend of mine who was a, a brought up a Jehovah's Witness, but he never joined, so he can still talk to his mom where all of his siblings can't because they joined and left. The only thing worse than having the truth is denying the truth. Since he was an atheist and never joined, he can talk to his mom, but she refuses to talk to any of their other kids. He would study optical illusions and show people optical illusions. So here's a picture of a famous person upside down, right? No big deal. It looks relatively normal. And, and I can hear it from the crowd. There, there's some certain point where it, it, it maybe looks a little off, but it's okay. And then it goes bad, really bad. And it's just past halfway. <laughs> Where suddenly your mind says, something's wrong. Well, the eyes and the mouth are upside down. But when the picture's upside down, you see the mouth and eyes right side up. Legos. Anybody seen the Brick Testament? Yeah. Uh, the story of Lot, Sodom and Gomorrah. The wife turns into a pillar of salt. He offers his daughters up to rave. They go into a cave. I only got three minutes left, so I got to be quick. They go into the cave, and the daughters are lamenting. Their father, the only man worthy of being saved, has no descendants. Keep this in mind. His daughters are lamenting he has no descendants. Bible lesson 101, women don't count. 
So they're thinking, how can we help our father, our dear beloved father, have descendants? Yeah. <laughs> so Lego porn is fantastic. <laughs> This is the older daughter, and it goes so well, she talks her sister into doing it the next night. <laughs> and then there's the great little story of Moses and all the Israelites. They're wandering around in the Sinai Peninsula, which is like 35 miles wide. There's 10,000 of them, but it takes them 40 years to find their way out. Great leadership skills. But <laughs> God shows up. He's back here in the, shows up in front of Moses, going to kick his ass, smite him maybe with a lightning bolt. And Moses is just panicked. Oh, no, what am I going to do? And Zephora, his wife, says, I know what to do. She grabs their son, rips off his pants, picks up a sharp stone, cuts the tip of his dick off, and rubs it on Moses' foot. And God goes, oh, darn, I have to leave now. And I tell the story, and exactly, and people go, that's not in there. Yeah, it is. It's your book. Read it. Uh, teach children about different cultures, societies, travel, go on vacations, do things, but never, ever underestimate the power of these systems. I underestimated the power of the systems. My kids were eight and 10, and my wife, all of them started thinking the earth was 6,000 years old as I sat there and watched it happen. And I've been an atheist since I was 13 and, and quite argumentative. I, I don't know if I wasn't paying enough attention. I don't know if I underassumed their capacity, but thankfully I fixed it, and I thank you so much for your time and attention today. Thank you.